Senior year, the supposed slacker year. I mean, come on, everyone's heard of senioritis, right? My interest in child psychi psychiatry set me up on a pretty different path for my senior year. I was lucky enough to be accepted into the ISM program, Independent Study and Mentorship. The acceptance definitely came with some butterflies. Anxiety since the fifth grade has led to nerves marking much of my childhood and keeping me in my comfort zone, but here I was taking a giant leap out. A class that d had a lot of speeches and interviews, that was not my strengths, but I was ready to accept the challenge and see what I could do. Um, I, as you can see on the screen, child psychiatry is not what I stuck with. Um, I decided to take an AP psychology course, and in the first chapter I was lucky enough to read about a subspecialty called neuropsychology. Finding my current topic was luck. First AP, uh, I'm sorry, um, neuropsychology is the study of relationship between behavior, emotion, cognition, and brain function. My name is Maddie Hebert, and I am studying neuropsychology. There are only about 1,000 neuropsychologists in the United States, but it is definitely a growing field. I was lucky enough to interview five of the neuropsychologists in the Dallas area. My first interview was with Dr. Sid Dixon. He works at the Baylor Institute of Rehabilitation by, the Toyota, by Toyota Stadium. He focuses on traumatic brain injuries, and he also um, works with the most mild type of traumatic brain injuries of concussions. He taught me that with concussions, you don't have any sort of um, CT scan or MRI that can help you with that diagnosis, so you really have to rely on afterwards and the behavior, so that's really where um, neuropsychology comes into play, where you're um, relating to what's happened inside the brain with how someone is behaving. Um, once a week, he also focused on Alzheimer's and dementia, which I found really great because that's what my initial interest kind of was in this field. So I was excited to see that I was already meeting people with that interest as well as something else that I could research later. Uh, my second interview took a very different path. It was with Dr. Michael McLean. He's a pediatric neuropsychologist, and he's in private practice. So he definitely has to wear all the hats. It's not just about seeing patients and writing up evaluations, but also there are some repeat patients that he sees that isn't especially common in this field. Um, but also um, he has to do the economic side of everything. So he has to do daily reports and send out invoices. So I learned from this that because econ is not my strength in song suit, song, strong suit, that private practice was probably not for me. So I continued with pediatric neuropsychology with uh, Dr. Lindy Pottinger. So this was a great interview and it really helped me to see kind of the excitement that people have for this and for what they're doing and kind of really m made me see that that's how I want to be if I continue with this as a job. Um, she is the director of Child Neuropsychology and Counseling Center what was really interesting about Dr. Pottinger was that she only received her PhD at age 50 and her oldest son was graduating from high school at the same time that she was getting her PhD. So it just kind of showed that even if you do family first and you focus on that aspect of your life, you can still wind up doing what you love. Um, a different take once again was with Dr. Kira Bison. She was a friend of Dr. Dixon, and I actually met her through his um, concussion program at the sidelines of a football game at the Ford Center. She works at Baylor Rehab on Warren, and um, she also did traumatic neuropsychology, but what was different about her than anyone else I had interviewed was that she was board certified in rehabilitation psychology, which means that she not only makes the diagnosis, but she also looks at what she's reported and helps with the treatment with another team of neuropsychologists. What really stuck with me from her interview is how she told me about how she could see a patient come in in a wheelchair that was expected to never be able to walk again and some that may not even be expected to live for more than six months and she can walk them out of the clinic because they've had such an impact on this person's life and really completely changed it around because they're not only not in a wheelchair, but they're living and they're walking and moving on with their lives. So my fifth and final interview was with Dr. Monroe Cullum. 
He works at UT Southwestern. Um, he's a professor in psychiatry, neurology, neuropsychology, and he also does some neurosurgery. Um, he does rehab counseling, and so he kind of wears all the hats in a different way than Dr. McLean, as he has everything related to the brain. Um, I. It was a great interview, and I was so stunned by how someone that has done so much for a growing field and has kind of taken on the role of a teacher more than anything was so humble, and it was just so crazy to see an intellectual ability that was unlike anything I'd ever seen before and such a humble and heartwarming person. Um, so I knew from the first question I asked and Dr. Collum told me that the favorite part of his job was teaching that he was going to be my mentor and we've had some great experiences so far but I'll touch on that later. Um, the interviews really helped me because because of it's a new field the research is not very conclusive and almost everything that I read ended with more studies still need to be done and this was only shown in this select group of people and wasn't really um, like a general um, conclusion. So I began my research with Alzheimer's and I wasn't really finding anything that I could really understand at the point that I was looking at it. There was a lot of like the chemical imbalances in the brain that were involved in that and that was very over my head at first because it was the first thing I had looked at. So kind of discouraged by that, I went into the interviews really looking for a simpler description at first to then relate to the more in-depth and specific research that I was finding to be able to understand and piece these different diseases together because people, neuropsychologists today are still trying to do that because especially Alzheimer's, it's still such a mystery. Um, I also did some research after my um, interview with Dr. Dixon and Dr. Bison about concussions and um, after meeting with Dr. Pottinger and Dr. McLean, I looked at autism and ADHD and things that are more common in children. Um, so my research led me to want to do concussions as my focus for my original work. Um, however, after kind of bouncing some ideas off Dr. Bison in that fourth interview that I had, we kind of came to the conclusion that there's so much that's unknown even to those with a PhD and have been studying this for a while that it would kind of be more difficult for me to get my foot in that door. So I decided to go back to the beginning and begin looking at Alzheimer's again because I kind of stepped away from that with traumatic brain injuries and concussions for a little while. So I decided everything that I came up with was way out of my range again because there's so much that's wide open in this field that you just kind of want to take that giant leap without taking the small steps to be where you have the knowledge that you can take that leap. Um, so I decided to back it up for a second and just look at the prior knowledge that I needed to be successful in any area of this field in any research. So I decided to first look at the parts of the brain so I made three models to incorporate Alzheimer's into my project as well. So I first created a normal brain model, which is right here. So I color coded it for each part of the brain. And then I um, did labels based on what each is involved in. So it was kind of like structure and function, what the structure is and how that's related to a human's function. So these are some of the descriptions for those. And then the other two diagrams that I made were based on CT scan models. So the one right here is obviously the Alzheimer's brain. So you can see that it's kind of shriveled up. It's degenerated. It's lost some of that brain tissue, as well as the fact that these ventricles are enlarged, which is also common with the disease. And then you have the normal one kind of showing um, how at such a late stage, it's almost, it's so different and it's, you don't know that's happening for so much of the disease and by the time you get a diagnosis this is normally what your brain looks like so that's why a lot of the medications aren't um, very successful. So along with the Alzheimer's part of the project I linked the the biggest symptoms of Alzheimer's to the different brain structures that I had just learned more about. 
So I put them into this chart. So like memory loss was linked to the hippocampus because the hippocampus is where um, new me memories are typically formed. And then like challenges and problem solving, I had the cerebrum and specifically the frontal lobe because that's where your higher level functioning is centered, just as an example of those. So mentor experiences. So as I said, I've had a great opportunity to work with Dr. Cullum. And um, my mentorship with Dr. Cullum is a little different as he has a lot of administrative duties as well. So we kind of had to, for me to get the full experience of neuropsychology, he decided that it would be best for me to um, meet with other neuropsychologists at UT Southwestern as well. So um, I have met with Dr. Labu and Dr. Didi Abani a lot. Um, they've really been helping me with my final product and I've also met with Dr. Rossetti and I'll kind of get into those as we go along. So my first mentor visit, I walk in the room and I'm kind of going through the mentor handbook with Dr. Cullum and this is kind of a <laughs> big memory that I have. Um, he goes, do you have a research project at the end of this? Because I have ideas. So we immediately go into it and he knows what he wants me to do. He wants me to take on a graduate um, student level project and to just jump right into the research. So he goes, okay, I'm going to give you these articles and there's some things that are linked to traumatic brain injury which can also be linked to Alzheimer's disease. So pick one of these and we'll see if that's a risk factor. So I go through and do the reading and I mean, for when I wrote my original product proposal, we hadn't talked about it in depth enough, so I was just kind of focusing on like the one um, factor and how that could be affecting the disease. Um, so I, a week later, I met with Dr. Labu and Dr. Didi Abani for the first time, and we sat down and I talked about how I wanted to focus about on Alzheimer's, and kind of just said, okay, but what about this? They asked me what my other interests were, and I was like, well, I've been exposed to mood disorders as well as concussions, and I wasn't even saying anything as if there was a correlation between the two, but that soon became my final product. So I'll touch more about that in a minute, but it was just crazy to see how I had um, discussed concussions in the past and kind of was discouraged by the whole idea after um, meeting with um, those that I had met from the on-site concussion team at the football games and then kind of coming full circle and looking back on concussions again as my final product. So some other um, um, big mentor experience that I, uh, experiences that I had were I met with Dr. Cullum after focusing mainly on final product stuff and we looked at a case and so it was a case he had just done and it was a high profile client and even if it wasn't of course confidentiality but we got to look at all their test results so he kind of took me through each test and showed me what it's supposed to do and what part of the brain that's really like trying to examine so there's tests that are mainly for higher level functioning and there's some like memory where you read off a list and you see how memory, many they can recall after maybe 10 minutes or 15 or 20 and then there's also you incorporate if rehearsing them helps if they get to see the list again so we looked at stuff like that and also um, more like visual spatial where they draw a picture and have to copy a picture that they it was shown to them and then afterwards they are asked maybe like five or ten minutes later to recreate what they saw so that was really great to see how with things that are kind of no other doctor could really diagnose so fully these simple tests that you would think to be activities done by an elementary school student could have led Dr. Cullum and his team to diagnose this high intellectual VIP as they called her with early Alzheimer's disease. It's obviously a difficult diagnosis to give because there's not a lot that's going on to help the disease because there's not many medications that work because by the time they start showing those symptoms it's pretty much too late as I showed you with my original work CT scan. So but they get to give them answers that they wouldn't have if they didn't have these neuropsychologists 
which is great because I've always been the type of person to ask why or why is this happening to someone. So to find something where you're piecing that together for someone else so that they can try to move on and have their family help them through it, it was just really great for me to see. So as I hinted at earlier, my final product is about concussions and depression. So my um, product is a poster. It's a research poster that deals with a correlation analysis. So we looked at the total number of concussions and how they related to depressive symptoms in retired NFL athletes. So we also decided to look at grade three concussions and depressive symptoms. Uh, grade three concussions are concussions with a loss of consciousness which aren't especially common and so there weren't a ton of athletes that had experienced those because our data set only included about 72 athletes. So what we did was we took the database that Dr. Dudabani had used for her original project with um, the NFL players and depressive symptoms and ran correlations based on cognition such as memory and learning and their ability to do that with the concussions and then we did the BDI scores which tests depression with the total number of concussions as well and we found that there was only a significant correlation meaning that there was less than five percent of a chance that the correlation was due to chance and not an actual relationship between the two variables um, that the depressive symptoms were in fact linked to um, the concussions. I mean, correlations don't give you a cause and effect relationship, so you have to always have to keep that in mind, but there was definitely a relationship there. After we, that was the only significant correlation we found between the um, grade three and the dep depressive symptoms and grade three and cognitive um, abilities as well as total number of concussions and cognitive abilities. So we'd only found total number of concussions and depressive symptoms, specifically in cognitive areas of depression. Um, so when we were going through the demographics of the data later in that visit, um, me and Dr. Labou noticed that there were two um, athletes that had reported that they had 50 or 60 concussions, which is kind of out of control. and it's hard to say that someone could really have 50 or 60 actual diagnosed concussions. So I left and he, he said he was going to rerun the correlations without the outliers so we could get a true result. So I came back the following week expecting to write our abstract up to submit to the sports neuropsychology conference to display the poster which was kind of the end game of the whole idea. Um, and he goes, we have a problem. What we had found was a skewed result because of the fact that we had those outliers. So the correlation that we had found with the depressive symptoms and total number of concussions was changed because of the people that had reported that they had 50 and 60 concussions. So we went back to the beginning and tried to find some other correlation, kind of had to step back and look at the project from a different perspective and see, okay, what can we do? So what we did was we split the athletes into two groups. We had those that had, after an initial neurological examination, reported that, the, that they were of normal cognition and those that were cognitively impaired. So what we ended up finding was that there was no correlation between total number of concussions and depressive symptoms or total number of concussions and um, cognitive abilities in the normal group at all. But we did find that there was a correlation between concussions with the loss of consciousness and depressive symptoms in those that had been diagnosed with cognitive impairment, which immediately after Dr. Lobu said this to me that there was a s statistical significance of a correlation there, I was like, well, couldn't that just be because they're dealing with this new diagnosis of cognitive impairment? And he goes, yes, but we still have to report this because there's not enough research to say that that is the cause. So after we ran all the correlations and did that aspect of the project, we moved on to the abstract. So an abstract is basically like the summary. It's what you always see when you um, look at a scholarly article or an academic journal that's at the beginning of a research paper. So I was lucky enough to have myself listed as first author on this project, so that's 
kind of crazy because this got submitted to a conference of successful sports neuropsychologists that all work with professional sports teams. So that's hard to fathom at times. So we did the purpose, methods, results, and conclusions. And it was crazy to me that we were putting everything that we had done over the past two weeks into 250 words. So it was kind of like everything that I had been recalling and thinking about with this and oh well it could be this or it could be this you can't put that because there's no fact and there's no evidence for that so we just kinda had to stick with what we actually found so after working on those aspects in at UT Southwestern with Dr. Labou we decided that it would be best for me to do the poster part of the project on my own and kind of take these sections and expand upon them and really elaborate on what we did and so that I could have the chance to work on a research project by myself rather than just answering the questions that they were offering because they've obviously done it before so it would be better for me to do it by myself so this is kind of this is the result after multiple um, drafts and edits and I wrote what I thought was best. It was reworded by Dr. Labou and then reworded by Dr. Didabani and then reworked by Dr. Cullum. So everyone's kind of had their foot in the water with this project. So this is what was just presented last weekend at the Sports Neuropsychology Conference by Dr. Labou in Cleveland, Ohio. He said that people will definitely express interest in the project project because of the fact that concussions are in the news so much lately, especially with football. So yeah, I would say that it definitely did give me the opportunity to see aspects of a research assignment in a, on a small scale because I didn't have contact with the patients. I didn't collect the data by myself. I didn't do that, but I did get to see how to run the correlations as well as what can happen if you have those outliers and how data can be skewed and how you have to be so careful with what you report because you never know if it's being affected by either an outside source or someone in your data set that had 60 concussions so that was definitely impactful and I'm so grateful that everyone was open to first of all letting me go into UT Southwestern but take on a project that I mean not all high school students would do it's a graduate um, school level and there's not very many high school students as Dr. Cullum tells me all the time that even know what neuropsychology is so they were kind of shocked by me even expressing an interest in it so they were like okay let's do this let's jump right in so I'm so grateful to say that the amount of people that I've seen what I've worked on and that's a senior in high school that's had work presented to professionals and as a sports person that these people work with professional sports teams that can kind of be like a dream in this field so that was just really great um, so I want to really thank Dr. Labou, Dr. Didabani and especially Dr. Cullum for giving me this experience and allowing me to get my foot in the door here because I can't major in neuropsychology but I can major in neuroscience or psychology which I'm planning on doing at Baylor so just thank you guys so much for giving me access to something that I couldn't even imagine doing in this class that was definitely nerve-wracking at first but I'm so thankful for all the results that I've gotten and how at the end of my speech my legs still aren't shaking like they are at the beginning so making progress there too so I just want to end with this that all our dreams can come true if we have the courage to pursue them by Walt Disney and it really means a lot to me because I hold myself back because of anxiety and being afraid of what can happen but I stepped out of my comfort zone here and I can make my dream of becoming a neuropsychologist to reality. Thank you.